Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, another season is upon us. 2021-2022 has finally started, and in true Flames form, it wouldn't be a regular season if we didn't drop a home opener. That just seems to be what the Flames do now. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt to talk about the first two games of the year and preview the road trip that's coming up. Yeah. Matt, did you expect any different? Did you expect us to finally win one? Well, you know, I can understand why they didn't, and it's frustrating that they did drop both games, but... Yeah, I was hopeful that for once, especially with the caliber of the competition, that they'd be able to win at least one of the two. But, yeah, no. Well, let's jump in and talk about those. The uh, The season opener for the Calgary Flames didn't take place too far from here. They went up the Kiwi 2 to Edmonton. Edmonton wore their uh, second stupidest jerseys, which are those blue ones with the orange oil logo on them, only second to their pylon jerseys. And... Uh, we had the we had Andrew Mangiapane open flame scoring for the year, getting the first Flames goal this game, but no match for uh, McDavid, who got a hat trick to send the Oilers home with a 5-2 victory. Matt, I think it's probably fair to say in this one, the Flames were good 5-on-5, five five, but if we're brutally honest, they lost because they took penalties at bad times and deflated their own momentum. Yeah, and anytime you're giving Connor McDavid opportunities to hurt you, He's going to hurt you, and, you know, like, you look at the carelessness of, like, say, the Rasmus Anderson roughing penalty in the first period, like, did Kyrie Yamamoto deserve getting punched in the face four times? Well, yes, because he's an oiler, but was that helpful? No. And, you know, like, yeah, you want to send a message that don't touch our goalie, but... On the other hand, you don't need to be giving a four-minute power play to the Oilers. Exactly. I mean, we've talked a lot about, you know, the Oilers' maybe lack of depth, but we got to give McDavid credit. You know, he is the best or one of the best in the league, and when you let that guy run rough shot, he's going to do damage, and that's exactly what the Flames did here. It It was, you know, hockey that was undisciplined, and I hate to say it, but the Flames kind of get what they deserve for the game they put on the ice. Yeah, and it's one of those things that when they were 5-on-5, five five, and even when they had their own power play opportunities, I thought the Flames did a lot of things extremely well. They engaged physically. The, uh, they were in on the Oilers. They were pretty much manhandling them the entire game. It's just... Yeah, it was a great 5-on-5 five five game. Yeah, like, there, there's nothing to complain about on that front, it, other than the lack of finish from a handful of the Flames players. But And when was the last time we saw 47 shots in a Flames game? Exactly. And, like, this is part of why, like, uh, hearkening back to when I had a little rant a few years ago, this su- is Daryl Sutter's way of coaching and his system, and that's what I was hoping for when he was brought aboard and now that he's had the time to fully implement his systems uh we're seeing that just dedication and to the effort levels and being in on the opponents all the time it's just the lack of finish and mental focus that sunk him in this game I think one thing that probably didn't help them was the fact that they only put 11 forwards out and 7 D-men. I mean, it was probably, it probably made sense going into this to have the 7 D-men because you had Shillington and they wanted to give ice time to, but Shillington only got three and a half minutes, three minutes, 27 seconds in this game. Like, why play the guy if you're not going to play the guy? I know, and the thing is, is that he looked rather effective in those few minutes, and it gets to a point where... It's almost hearkening back to the um, Sam Bennett situation where you have a player who's talented but is not getting any opportunities. And I know. I wouldn't say Bennett didn't get any opportunities. uh, Well, not consistently on the first or second line uh, for any duration. Like, he got a game here and there, and then. I think Bennett also kind of tanked himself by playing undisciplined hockey a lot of times. You can't trust a guy like that on your top couple lines. Uh, how would you say, with a young player, you kind of have to give him an actual shot at some point? 
if they're even showing a pulse. And they didn't. And now he's one of the Florida Panthers' best players. And I think with Shillington, you're seeing a lot of the same things where there's a lot of positive aspects to Shillington's game. And he's showing some dynamic play. And then they just don't play him. And it's hard for him to get any actual consistency in his own game. Because young players are going to make mistakes. And he is getting better at minimizing them. But he needs to actually be able to learn on the job. And, you know, like, you look back at TJ Brody. In his first couple seasons, he was a mess defensively. But then he figured it out. Because he was actually given the opportunities to make mistakes. And he became a top-pairing defenseman for almost a full decade. Yeah, and, and you know, I guess too. I mean, I'm trying to think if I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. But when you're down in a game as bad as the Flames were here at one point, why not play the guy? Like, you know, they played Good Branson for 16 minutes. I wouldn't say that Good Branson looked markably better than Shillington did. So at some point, if you're trying, like you said, to push the young guy into a into a better role in your team why not just give him the ice time right at some point just say hey you know we're down it's not like you know we're close enough where he might lose us the game and he didn't look bad enough where he's gonna lose us the game he's not just standing around doing nothing like why not you know take good Branson who you know what you've got with him and take some of those minutes and give him to Shillington I just I don't understand the logic no I know and it's just frustrating because of the fact that when Shillington's been given a shot, there seems to be something there there. Whether or not there is or not, you know, who knows until he actually gets a shot. Or he goes and plays for some other team and they give him the shot. So like you're saying with Bennett. Yeah. Well, I don't think there's much else to say about the Edmonton game, except that, you know, we get stymied by Mike Smith again. He seems to play good against the Flames, but didn't play great for the Flames. Well, the the thing is, is that Mike Smith is a goalie who requires the team in front of him to be trash. You know, when he was with Arizona, he was awesome when he, the, the Coyotes were giving up 40, 50 shots a game. He was absolutely amazing. He comes to a team with Calgary who is limiting the shots to like 25 to 30. Oh, he sucks. Then he goes to Edmonton. Oh, hey, they gave up 47 shots. He's awesome again. And now he's on the IR. They put him on the IR today and brought Skinner up. But this isn't Oilers podcast. We don't talk about Oilers news. Yeah. Um, the next game was on the 18th, and this was the Calgary Flames home opener. I want to call out the Flames before we get to the game for saying what an amazing intro this was. I think a great salute to the healthcare workers and, you know, a group that especially now with our fourth wave are doing, you know, amazing work and, and keeping everything afloat here. So big credit to the Flames organization. They've had some really good presentations of that kind over the last couple of years. They go all the way back to like the Jerome McGinley retirement, which I thought was fantastically done. Um, really, really awesome intro there with the healthcare workers. I agree. And it's good that the flames took, uh, enough time to actually do a proper job to salute everybody who's been working so hard to save the lives of everybody in Alberta. Exactly. Um, and then if we jump into the game, I thought, you know what? Last year, the Flames didn't make the playoffs because they didn't get enough loser points. And so when they got a loser point here, I thought, well, at least we got one point out of this one. But they looked sluggish in the first, I thought. They looked really good in the second. But just like in the in the game before this, I thought they just didn't execute when they needed to. They were looking good, but um, they, they led in most metrics. But again, because of the power play goals and just not executing when they needed to, they lost. Yeah, and it's hard when your four best players just don't really show up offensively. And frankly, the Flames played well enough where they should have won and should have won handily. And credit to John Gibson for pulling a Mike Smith and playing well while getting shelled. Um, this is another game where the Flames, for the last... 10 minutes or so of the first period right through the end of the second I thought we're just walking all over the Ducks but 
they just couldn't seem to actually translate that into any actual goals. And, you know, you let anybody hang around with a one-goal lead, all it takes is one bad bounce or one breakdown, and it led to Raquel scoring, and then the overtime, which was that whole sequence that led to the game winner was just a whole cluster of bad hockey decisions <laughs> by everybody. Did, looking at the lineup the Flames put out there and sort of where guys were playing in this one, does it feel like this lineup is still a work in progress? I mean, we even saw Blake Coleman here on the third line with Lou Cheech. That's obviously not where he's going to land, you hope. I mean, we don't pay that much money for a guy to play on the third line. It Does it sort of feel like maybe there's still some preseason kinks to be worked out? Well, it doesn't help that uh, both uh, Tyler Pitlick and uh, Brad Richardson are still out. And I think that like what you would likely see is Dubé sliding down to the third line into Lucic's spot, Pitlick sliding into Coleman's spot, Lucic going down to the fourth line with Richardson, and then Coleman being on the second line opposite Mangiapane. See, and I would have even made the simple switch last week to just do um, Dubé on the third and Coleman on the second just to get him playing with, with the guys he's going to be playing with, especially in a new team. Yeah, I, I am not arguing with that. So, Matt, another guy who I think might be in the wrong spot or maybe needs to be moved is uh, Nikita Zadorov. He's obviously playing with Tanev and, and was last game, but to me he's not looking like a top four guy. He's he's looking slow. He got beat a couple times. He's looking like he's a 5-6 guy. Do you keep him in the top four because he's maybe the best we've got, or do you try someone else there? Oh, I think the uh, good opportunity for Valimaki to slot in there for even a period or two just to see – how he would fare being on that pairing. And if not, you know, have Shillington in the lineup, that might be a viable option as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I would even at this point give good Branson a shot there for a period and see how two veterans would look together, him and Tanev. Yeah, it doesn't hurt. I think I'm one of the few that's not crapping all over the good Branson deal. No, I, I liked it when we signed it, even though the dollars, that was my only complaint, was the dollars were slightly high, but it's a one-year deal, so who cares? Um, That's it. If it was if it was multi-year, I'd have an issue, but for one year, we've got the cash. Why not? Yeah, and like Good Branson, yeah, he'll make mistakes, but you know his physical presence is what you're paying for, and He's, if you're limiting him to, let's say, five, six minutes, everybody's going to make a mistake who's a five, six. Yeah, exactly. So, Matt, two games in, two losses at this point. The Calgary Flames in the Pacific Division of eight teams sit eighth. They've played two games. They have zero wins, one loss, and one overtime loss for one total point. Um which puts us at the bottom of the division right now, tied with Chicago, Winnipeg, Arizona in the West for last. Are you and and the, there's only one team who's doing worse than us, and that's Montreal, who has zero points so far in more games. Are you looking at this so far as doom and gloom, or is this just usual Calgary Flames beginning of season slump? Well, look at it more like say this was the middle of the season, right? And you have a team who has played has a five game five day break and playing against a team who just played like on two days rest that team that has the extra break is going to be a little sluggish more so than normal and because of the sluggishness you know that led to the loss i think if the flames had already played a game before the edmonton game i think that a little bit of the kinks might have been worked out and you know, I think that might have helped. And it's one of those things, like, if the Flames were playing badly in the games and they lost, uh, I'd be a lot more concerned. But, like, they got over 90 shots in two games. I agree. Like, it, that's a big thing. And, you know, like, if they're able to keep up even close to that level of effort where they're just grinding the opposition down more often than not they're going to win like you you have to figure that Gaudreau, Monahan, Lindholm and Kachuk are not going to be bad offensively all year 
Like, they were not really generating a lot of scoring chances in the two games. But in, you know, like, when they actually get going, this team will be better off. Every Nobody has ever won 82 games, right? And the people that are crapping on the Flames so far, I've reminded them of that is, you know what? We're starting slow. We usually start slow. Like you said, I think there's enough good in these games that we can look at and say, yeah, the Flames are playing good hockey. Maybe they need some polish. Maybe they need some work. Maybe they need to, you know, work on the discipline. But I'm seeing enough good stuff there that once they sort of get things cleaned up, hopefully on this road trip, I think they can start winning. But it, like you said, not like they're going out there and doing nothing. I mean, how many games have we seen where they get down and they give up? And I didn't see that in either of these games. They, you know, they got down or they maybe got... Um, I wouldn't even say down, but maybe things stopped, stopped going their way and they didn't just start giving up. Well, even take the Oilers game. They went down 3 nothing and fought back nearly to tie it. And Exactly, and how often does that happen? How Usually we get down 3 nothing and we just stop playing. Yeah, like it reminds me of the 107-point season where they were actually able to come back a lot of times. Like any time they'd get down a goal or two, they'd actually come back and win. And, you know, it's... One of those things that if the Flames were playing like where they were just like not skating and you know you're going uh, where did the team go for half a period like we saw frequently last year, then it'd be a lot more concerning. But like, they were basically playing hard throughout all 60 minutes in each game and it was just a couple of careless lapses really that allowed you know bad decisions ending up in the back of the net and you know those happen you just have to try and minimize them as you move forward yeah no i agree there i think that there's you know a lot of people are already saying oh the flames can't do it that sort of thing i think that they can do it there's just things that we need to work on i'm hoping the five game uh the five game road trip will help with that yeah and you know just as a point of note when you're on a three on three in overtime you can pass it all the way back down to your goalie you know so like monahan and hannafin if you get trapped you have an option behind you you know you don't have to just skate right into the opposition and then you know stop skating <laughs> Yeah, and again, you know, I think cleaning some things up, and, and I think part of this too, and, and we see this anytime we bring in a new coach, right? There's, And, and I'll still look at Daryl as a new coach because he hasn't had a full season with this team to implement his way of doing things. But I, I get the sense in these two games there's some guys that were trying to do something a new way and weren't totally comfortable with it yet or didn't quite know what they were supposed to be doing. I got that sense a few times, especially when the Flames were on the PK of just guys, it almost seemed like, I don't know if you saw this too, but it's almost like they went with the, they tried to react naturally and they almost backed off and said, what am I supposed to be doing? And that you know extra second of hesitation caused them to lose the puck or lose the man or whatever. So I think as these guys get more comfortable with Daryl's system, we're going to see a lot of these things cleaned up too. Yeah, and you, you normally see that any time a new coach is hired. Like teams usually go like 2, 8, and 1 or, you know, insert approximate same numbers for like the first 10, 12, 15 games and then they go on a kill streak after that and it's one of those things that I think that for the first couple of weeks as long as the Flames are doing all right during that stretch at, while they're figuring it out you know then when they figure it out they'll be a lot better and I think to give credit to these guys too there's a lot of new faces here I mean they lost their leader I'd say about half the forward ranks, once everyone's healthy, are going to be new. Um, you know, significant changes on the back end. Like, I think part of it's the new coach and part of it's just figuring out how to play with the new guys and how these new guys fit, both on and off the ice. And I think there's a lot of growing pains that we're seeing them working through here. Yep. And it's one of those uh, things that it's just a matter of time and patience and waiting for... Uh, more repetitions, uh, more game action, and seeing how they respond. So, Matt, if we look at the road trip coming up, the Flames are going on a five-game road trip. About a week and a half, they're going to be on the road. Um, well, I guess Perfectly so. placed, in my opinion. Yeah, I guess actually, yeah, probably a week and a half by the time all said and done. 
Uh, what changes are you making in this lineup? We already said that Coleman needs to move into the top six. We saw Dylan Dubé get some time at center in the in the preseason. Do you move Dubé to maybe four C, or do you keep him on the wing? What do you do with the with these guys to to put them in the right spot? Well, to uh, Dubé's credit, I thought he looked a lot better uh, this couple of games uh, than he did for most of last season. And he's taking a little bit more of a step towards being a good, high-quality middle six player. Um, I would also ask on that while you're there, how much of that do you think is the guys he's with? I mean, you know, when you're with Monaghan and Mongepani, it's tough to not look good. True, but um, I've been noticing that, like, he's doing certain things that he wasn't last year. Just small little detail-oriented things. And he's just looking a little bit more composed overall. And, you know, I I think partially the line mates help just the confidence level. But, you know, a little bit better on his own as well. Um, I think that what you'll see uh, is uh, Pitlick and Richardson as they're getting healthy slot in uh, to three and four spots uh, somewhere along there. And, yeah, some deck chairs will be shuffled. So if we look at this, we we probably keep the Johnny Goudreau, Elias Lindholm, Matthew Kachuk line as, let's call it, one. Yep. And then you've got Sean Monaghan, Mongepani, and Coleman as two. Yeah, I would agree with that. And then I think you were saying earlier Lucic to four, but I think... I'm almost thinking that you keep Lucic, Backlund, and Dubé as your third line. I think that there's enough of a little bit of everything on that line. Yeah. And then, I mean, they just sent Glenn Godden down, so they need a centerman. So I think you'll have probably Lewis, Pitlick, and Richie as your fourth line, at least coming into Detroit. Could very well be. I don't know that you want to start relegating Luch to the fourth line yet. I think there's still enough value there, and especially if we're still thinking, as you and I have for a while, this guy might be your captain this year. I don't know that you start relegating him to the fourth line. I think Luch has more value than... And when he's off, when he puts on the offensive game, we've seen him do good. I mean, he's got more value than just, you know, your fourth line grinder guy. And then, Matt, I guess the other thing, you were mentioning Tyler Pitlick coming off the IR... I think that the Flames are probably looking at Pitlick to be one of their full-time guys this year, or at least a guy who's in the lineup regularly, based on what they gave up for him and all that. Yeah. I don't think he's going to be one of your your press box regulars. So, I mean, I think part of what we need to do is figure out who Pitlick plays well with. Is it uh, Lucic Backland? Is it Dubé? Is it Coleman? And I think Pitlick's going to kind of float between lines three and four until then. But with uh, Glenn Godden moving to the the farm, I mean, there's really not a lot of options here. You've got, what, Pitlick and Richardson as your other forwards. Richardson's still IR. Do we know what Richardson's on the IR with? Not sure at the moment. This seems like it's a, we don't want to use you. Go trip over something so we can get the cap relief type injury. Apparently body, stones hurt too. Body injury. <laughs> That's right. Upper slash lower body injury. Somewhere he's injured. Yes. Pick a place um, and, you know, sure. That's right. And Michael Stone is apparently out now, too. Again, is this a cap thing? I have no idea. Yeah. We'll see. Um, but, yeah, I think that I think where Pitlick fits in is going to be the big question. But when I look at, I mean, when I look at this lineup, Dubé can't go any lower than three, right? You're not going to start playing Dubé on the fourth. No, because then you're just wasting his his abilities. And I think him and Backlund have have historically looked good together, so I think you keep them there. But I don't know that... I mean, if we look at the fourth-line guys, Lewis, Richie, and Pitlick, are any of them an upgrade on Lucic? Not really. So I think, you, I think your, your top three are set. And then I think, honestly, of those other guys we just mentioned, Pitlick's kind of the one guy I say put on four and whoever you want to put with him. Like, he kind of seems like that fourth line staple and it kind of becomes it sounds like a law firm Pitlick and company yeah um but yeah i think i think we'll see him there let's talk about glenn godden we mentioned him the flames uh took tyler Pitlick off the ir as they move on to this road trip and put glenn godden on the ir you or sorry not on the ir on waivers to make room for the guy coming off the ir um you and i talked about this that glenn godden probably doesn't fit here all year 
I watched Glenn Godden in the first couple games, and he just he seems like he's missing something. I don't know if it's foot speed or reaction time, but he just doesn't seem like he's quite NHL ready yet. He feels like he's going to be, or at least for now, it feels like he's going to be one of those weird guys every team has that's better than the AHL, not quite good enough for the NHL, and that perpetual tweener. What do you think about Godden? Yeah, like a Derek Grant type situation or, you know, any of those generic, you know, 14. Buddy sport. Robinson. Yeah. yeah, I think a guy who you can call up for a couple games, but I don't, I just, I want him to succeed. He's an older guy. I want to see some youth on this team, but he just doesn't seem like he's quite got it. Yeah, it's one of those where his ability, like raw physical abilities are kind of lacking, but the effort level and the mind are there. And, like, he's a very smart player. It's just, like, his lack of foot speed and lack of reaction time, I think, are the two things that are sinking him at the moment. And if they can work with him on the foot speed, then I think he could develop into an NHL regular. But if, like, this is what he is, I don't see him being more than the cup of coffee guy anytime injuries happen. And even working with him on the foot speed, I mean, he's 24 now. I kind of feel like he is where he is with those kind of skill developments. Like, you don't see a lot of 24-year-old guys making those changes. And, I don't know, I just kind of, I feel like he's developed those kind of skills as far as he's going to at this point. And you're very likely right. And, you know, I think he'll be a good player for Stockton and, Perhaps getting the occasional recall up here. You know, yeah, I mean, he's he's a good guy. I think he's great to have around. Like you said, the mind is good, and I think that's a guy who you might want to kind of keep in your AHL system to help work with some of those younger guys and make them look better. But he hasn't – I think he's got a good enough audition to know what he is. How often have, you, have they brought someone up, and you and I have said, we didn't get a good look at him. I think between this year and last year, they've got a good enough look at him to know what he is, and I just don't think he's there. And at this point, I don't know he will be. Yeah, and I agree wholeheartedly. And it's one of those things that he just needs to tear up the A again and force his way back into the NHL and see if he can make any progress from where he's at currently. And if not, then he'll just be the 13th, 14th guy anyway. And even then, I I think that there's going to be enough other guys coming out of Stockton in the next two or three years here that I think he could easily get surpassed for that 13th, 14th guy. Yeah, and that, frankly, I think a few of them are already in Stockton now. There's a... Well, yeah, I think they're there, but I just mean coming out of there, like being, you know, NHL ready, I think. And there's... Don't get me wrong. There's a good... I shouldn't say good. There's a, a decent living to be made being a AHL player. And I think that Godin might be one of these guys that makes a career... As your AHL player. I mean, we've seen guys who do that. They drift from organization to organization, sort of being your AHL stalwart. And I think that honestly might become this guy's future. Yeah. And as long it's one of those things where it, in that kind of a position, you want somebody who's smart defensively and will give a consistently decent defensive effort. And for what God End's done thus far, he definitely fulfills the first of the requirements and perhaps a little bit of the second one too. You know, this is a guy who was drafted by the St. Louis blues in the fourth round of 2015, I believe. So we didn't give up an asset for him. So, you know, the fact that we kind of got him for free, um, in 2017, when he signed a three year deal with the flames, you know, if he doesn't turn out, he doesn't turn out. And I, I probably shouldn't put it this way, but how, I mean, the Blues probably passed on him for a reason. How many guys that get passed over by one training camp? There's always exceptions. Don't get me wrong. But how often do you see that guy that gets drafted, leaves, goes to another organization, and looks spectacular? Like, your first organization passed for a reason. I don't know what that reason is, but there's got to be something there. Um, He's also a BC kid, and with an AHL team now back in BC, I could see him... Uh, after the Flames, going and playing Abbotsford, or where's the team now? Yeah, Abbotsford for a couple of years. So, I mean, we've seen Godin now, Matt, sent down to the AHL, the first guy sent down, and the f- guy we thought would be the first guy sent down. If you're looking to recall a forward this year, if it's not just an emergency situation, if you're Brad Trilliving, 
do you go back to Godan, or do you say, you know, we know what we've got with Glenn. Maybe it's not there. Let's try somebody else. Um, I think it will depend largely on the situation of who exactly they're getting replaced. Like if it's uh, more of a defensive player, you know, Godin I think would be the best option, uh, whether it's a center or a winger. Um, if it's more of an offensive guy, then, you know, you're going to look at uh, Phillips or uh, Pedersen instead. I was going to say, I think there's some other guys there that, and, and Phillips is the guy I was primarily thinking of, who I think you got to give a look at too. There's some really nice looking young guys as well on that team. But I think Phillips is another guy. You've got to see what you've got there. I mean, he's getting... He's getting a bit older as well, Matthew Phillips, and I think you've got to figure out, do you keep him around? Do you cut bait on him? Do you move him for an asset? I mean, he's 23. I think he's the next guy I'd be giving a look to. Yeah, I agree. And, and, I, th- and I think we have enough veterans. You're not going to call a guy up just to fill a, a, a roster spot this year, but I think if you want to give a guy a look, he's the next guy. Yeah, and if you look at, the, like, the Flames have a whole bunch of players that are kind of in that, needing a shot just to see if they can make it in the NHL, whether it's Philp, Pospisil, Ruzitska, Phillips, or um, Pedersen. Like, they all look like they're ready for at least a game or two. So it'll be interesting to see what and who will actually get recalled this year. I always look at it that by the time you're 24, if you haven't played in the NHL, you're probably not going to unless it's on an emergency basis. So for Or you're European. Be- that's basically the only... That's true. But I guess, yeah, if you're 24 and you're in the AHL, I should say. So, um, you know, Luke Philip, Luke Philip is 25. Justin Kirkland, 25. We know what we got there. He's not going to become a, a regular. Uh, Tulola is 23. I think he still needs some work. Walker Dewar, I think, is still best served in the AHL. And then uh, Philip Phillips, as we said, is 23. So I think... Yeah, you've got to give Phillips a look. You maybe give uh, Tulola a look. He's one of the older guys, but I think, you know, a lot of people want to see Emilio Pedersen stuff. He's 21, leave him in the AHL. And I think there's actually some harm you can do to a guy. A lot of people want to bring a guy up who's looking fantastic in the A, but if you're on a hot streak and you bring him up, you can really disturb that hot streak. I think at some point it's like, you know what, you're doing great in the A, just stay there and keep doing great. We see teams all the time, they're bringing up the guy who's on like a 10-game point streak and then you break the streak and he doesn't look good after that. Yeah, and I think that it'll be a largely a situation where the Flames are going to have to play things by ear as the season goes on to determine like who is most likely to benefit from the recall both in the short term and the long term. And I think a lot of that will also depend on COVID restrictions. If we have to sit a guy out for a week to quarantine at some point before he can get called up, nobody's going to benefit from that. I think that's where you'll find the veteran bodies playing maybe more than you want them to because they're here. Yeah. Hence why the Flames have Stone and Good Branson and Shillington. Well, and I would even say on the forward side, I think why they've got, you know, Richardson here and um, Lewis here. Like, I think that we loaded up on extra veteran bodies knowing that there might be another quarantine period there because nobody wants to see a guy taken out of action for a week and sit in a hotel room. That's not going to benefit anyone. Oh, for sure. And I think that for a whole litany of reasons, it's better for everybody to have things work out that way. Um, another guy I wanted to get your thoughts on so far is Rasmus Anderson. We've seen him being really the, I would say, the leader on defense. He's been playing on the first pairing with Hannafin in the last couple games. I'd call it the first pairing. In the Edmonton game, he got hand over, uh, hand over foot the highest ice time of these guys. Anderson's a guy that we've seen, you know, really good from. And then last year, he didn't look great. Mind you, not a lot of people look great for a lot of that year. Are you starting to see what we need to see from Anderson so far in this role? Well, I think that Anderson has it in him to be a top-tier defenseman in the NHL. I agree. And especially with his right-handed slap shot, like, and he can get it on net, and it's a hard shot, that he basically, by and large, needed to work on all the secondary parts of his game in order to take himself to that next level. And now he's being able to accurately and efficiently use all of his talents 
to generate offense in the offensive zone and just generally be a pain to play against. And I, I like everything that he's done the last two games, uh, even punching Yamamoto in the face. You know, like, yeah, it was... You think it was worth the fine? Yeah. You know, you get you have to pay $5,000 to punch an oiler in the face. I think that pretty much anybody would be a game for that. <laughs> this sounds like some sort of stampede game. Pay five grand to punch an oiler in the face. Maybe you should set up a booth next year. <laughs> I'm sure you can find some disgraced oiler who needs a payday. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that Hannafin's the right partner for him. I mean, we'd had some discussions previously about, do you put him with Tanev? Do you put him with Hannafin? I think these are two guys in Anderson Hannafin that need to break out and both need, you know, a great season. They're both young guys and both have potential, I think, to be number one. And well, I think and Hannif- plus it, it helps uh, them feed off of each other because of the fact that, you know, the coaching staff, it, it, you know, because Giordano's not here, well, if you're playing well, you know, you'll get the ice time. And with each of them trying to emerge as the guy after Giordano, uh, you know, I think that each can see what the other's doing on the ice at any given minute and say, okay, I need to be better because, like, this guy's actually kicking some butt right now. And and I think even outside of that, growing them as a pair, these are two 24-year-old defensemen. I don't think that they're necessarily competing for number one, but I think if you can grow these guys as a pair, you could have a long-term pair for this team. Oh, I agree. And you need everything to build together, you know, both on the individual level and as the pairing, uh, so that way they can hopefully ascend into being a legitimate top pairing in the NHL. Which, with how Anderson's played those two games, it, he looks like he's a number one defenseman. I know a lot of Flames fans have given um, Noah Hannafin sort of a, a raw deal. We've talked about shipping him out and stuff, and I think Suns fans look at a defenseman who's not a high point producer as ineffective. But what I like here, I think Anderson's the more offensively minded of the two. But I think Anderson plays better when he's with a more defensive-minded partner, like when he was with Hamannick, and I think now with Hannafin, I think the nice thing with those two, they have clear roles. I think, like you were saying, Anderson's got the shot. Hamannick, I don't think, is the guy you want shooting as much, but I think they complement each other well. They can both be offensive. They can both be defensive. But I think there's sort of a clear offensive and defensive defenseman on that pairing. Yeah, I agree. And I think they're both guys that, and I think you want this from your first pair, both guys that can cheat up if they need to in the offensive zone and help generate a little bit more offense that way, but also are fast enough they're not going to get caught out of position. I agree, and that will hopefully continue to progress as the season goes on. You know, I was at first thinking maybe we should put one of them with Tanev because he's the veteran, but, I mean, Hannafin's been around this league for a long time, and he's only 24. He's just as much a vet as anybody else in our blue line. So I think, you know, Hannafin and Anderson, if you can grow that pair together, like you said, that could be a top pair in the league, and why mess with the chemistry? Sort of like our chemistry of our first line of, you know, when you find guys that work, just keep them together. Yep. And for whatever reason, the, the pairing it seems to have worked in the first two games. So you just keep letting it rip until one of them starts to falter a little bit, if they do. I think they're a pair that, uh, I think they make each other better. You know, it's not one guy. We said this how often with Giordano and Brody, where it was sort of Geo carrying Brody or Geo carrying whoever he played with. I don't think one of them's carrying the other. I think, um, they're making each other better. They they cover each other's weakness as well. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to seeing some more slap shots from Anderson because he looks like he's about ready to uncork a few. So you were mentioning uh, Anderson a few times and, you know, uh, hitting the Yamamoto. I mean, that is officially, I think, the league has determined a headbutt. Not something we well, see very uh, often the, the angle uh, actually showed that uh, it wasn't a headbutt. Uh, they had a reverse angle. And because he basically headbutted his own hand, which then hit Yamamoto. The fine was purely for like the few seconds after that, when Yamamoto was kind of like just sit, standing there and Anderson like clocked him four times. And that's something some elementary school kids do. Like, why are you hitting me with my own hand? You know? Yeah. Headbutt your own hand and hit somebody else. 
Well, that's the way to do car- it. During carpet time in elementary school. Um, did you think it was a headbutt? I mean, from the angle that we originally saw it at before we got the review, did you think it was a headbutt? Did you think it was an intentional headbutt? Uh, I think that he, he was trying to just force, uh, like, shove um, Yamamoto into the boards, and it just looked a lot worse than it was, and the reverse angle showed that it wasn't really even that close to a headbutt, more just, like, him trying to, like, quickly shove the guy hard into the boards. I agree. Yeah, I didn't think it was a headbutt uh, when we saw it. By the time people listen to this, I think it's going to be too late to vote, but just an interesting Flames tidbit here as we move away from the last season or the last week of the Flames. Harvey the Hound is being uh, or is up for nomination in the Mascot Hall of Fame this year. Um, He can be voted into the Mascot Hall of Fame. He's in the 2022 class along with one other NHL mascot, and that's Iceberg, which is the Pittsburgh Penguins mascot, who's also in that class. So voting's open till the 23rd of October. If you do hear this before then, you can go to mascotholofame.com and vote. But I think the fact that Harvey was the first NHL mascot, I'm surprised he's not in there already. Like That seems like somebody that should be in the Hall of Fame, and this has been a staple. I can't name any other NHL team that's had a mascot for that long. I, I think outside of the Flyers mascot. I I don't even know any other NHL mascots. Do the Oilers still have that weird bobcat? Yeah, Hunter, I think, is that one's name. Um, Yeah, I think that... uh, Like, outside of Gritty, uh, basically, I think a lot of um, various mascots don't really have a lot of staying power outside of their... They come and they go. Yeah, and... Yet, Harvey's been able to endure for 30 years, and, you know, yet being able to maintain some freshness in his routines. So, we'll see. I think, And I uh, think also the mascot that isn't just a, like, you know, the the Bruins have a bear. The Canucks have a whale. Like, he's not Scorch. He's not a flame. He's not, you know, a piece of fire. Like, I think one of the few mascots has nothing to do with the team, but has had lasting power as well. Yeah. So if you, next year, I don't know what it takes to get somebody inducted, but we should start a campaign here, Matt, to get Scorch inducted as well. Um, I don't know if, if you can actually get a mascot inducted who never actually mascotted because he died before his first game. <laughs> but um, let's let's all, if you, again, if you're listening to this before the 23rd, go to mascotholofame.com and vote for Harvey. I think if anybody deserves it, it's Harvey. Oh, Yuppie is the other one I know. Is uh, the I was just thinking my way through this is the Canadians mascot, but Harvey definitely deserves to be in there. Yeah, I know. And there's a lot of just dumb ones, um, or the funding for the arena, or whatever fell through for. There's. I'm just looking here at the Wikipedia list of different mascots. Half of these I've never heard of. Like in Detroit, Dallas, their mascot is a green alien named Victor E. Green. Yeah. Oh, that's a lame name. Um, the Chicago Blackhawks apparently have a hawk named Tommy Hawk. I didn't know that the Tampa Bay Lightning had Thunderbug. Like these all just seem like we need a mascot. What's the you know what mascot costumes available at the Halloween Superstore? Yeah. Oh, I know. Hey, this is somewhat relevant. Yay. Stanley C. Panther and Victor E. Rat are the ones in Florida. And again, I don't know about all the other teams and all the other markets, but it just seems like the Calgary Flames organization does a good job with mascots. Between the Flames, the Hitmen, um, you know, all the different mascots they have here, it seems like mascots are really a part of uh, the the Riggers, uh, the the Roughnecks, I should say, um, even the Stamps. You know, it just feels like mascots are a big part of Calgary's sport, and we do them well. Yeah. So let's get Harvey in there. Let's make sure that Hunter never makes it in. That weird Canadian lynx um, that scares children in Edmonton. If you're going to an Oilers game, it's already scary enough. You don't need to be scared by a weird Canadian lynx mascot that looks like something out of Friday the 13th movie. Yeah. Uh, And I'm going to be really upset if Iceberg, the uh, Penguins mascot, makes it in and Harvey hasn't. Yeah. We'll see. I didn't even know they. I didn't even know they had a mascot. So I know uh, with so many of these teams, it's like um, okay, yeah. Oh, here's a really here's a really lame one. What do you think the name of the Winnipeg Jets slash Manitoba Moose's mascot is? 
I have no idea, but I know it's Mi Mickey Moose. Yeah, that that. <laughs> you know, I'm surprised that Disney hasn't sued them. You know, that's close enough where it's like, um, yeah, that's not right. Well, but it's not Mickey. It's Mick E. Moose. That's how they're getting around it. I think. Yeah. I know that that's but really chintzy. I, I think Disney can't sue them though, unless there's confusion in the market. I don't think anybody's confusing the Winnipeg Jets mascot for the happiest place on the on earth. Or the Winnipeg Jets Arena for Disney World. Or Winnipeg in general. <laughs> well, that's it. That's probably why they don't care. It's like the, it, it's like the, uh, you know, back in the day when you get exiled to Siberia, it's like Mickey's, you know, cousin who got exiled to Winnipeg. Yeah. Um. So yeah, no. Let's let's get Harvey into the mascot Hall of Fame if we can. That that sounds like I think that'd be awesome for him. He's been a big part of the NHL. I mean, he even went to China. How many teams take their mascots overseas and we went to China? He's in part of the All Star Games when they're not in Calgary. Like he's Harvey's a staple, I'd say, even in the NHL outside of Calgary. Yeah, I agree, and it'll be interesting to see how that shakes out because I would assume I did, that I, I did learn some things about Harvey on the uh, mascot Hall of Fame site. His position is center of attention. He's six foot six, two hundred pounds. Shoots and then says in brackets, marks his territory, right? He was acquired by the Flames, their first round pound, their first pound draft pick in 1983. So all, all things I didn't know about Harvey. Yeah, all very lame. Very, very <laughs> but, lame. But, you know, very lame, but they fit the character. Oh, right? I, I mean, Harvey's kind of... Harvey's kind of goofy, and Harvey doesn't wear a shirt for some reason. He's, I think, also one of the only mascots that doesn't wear his team's jersey. Yeah. Harvey's shirtless most of the time, which I don't know how he's allowed in the dome. Nobody else can get in shirtless. I never thought of that before. Yeah. At least he's wearing should, pants most of the time. If I just showed up with pants and a drum and a bone, they wouldn't let me in. <laughs> Be like, oh, it's Dan again. <laughs> Dan, we told you last week. Put a shirt on. <laughs> We sell them at Fanatic. <laughs> well, Matt, let's look ahead to this road this road swing, shall we? Yep. We got four games coming up. The Calgary Flames are on the road. I think it's a good thing they're going on the road, as you mentioned early. I think it's a good time to get this team together. I think it's a good time to sort of build some chemistry while you're on the road. You get that. And we've heard a lot of times from the team when they go on those seven-game or two-week road trips late in the season – that they tend that's when chemistry tends to be built. And they have some long road trips this year. I'm just looking ahead to their schedule, but I think one early in the year is gonna be good for them. Yeah, so, well I think uh, that uh like over the first two months of the season they're pretty much on the road for the vast majority of it. Which is good because of the fact that later on in the season they're gonna be playing a ton of home games. They have a really big road trip in November from the eleventh to the pretty much the twenty first they're on the road. Yeah, and you got to figure that with that, um, if the Flames are able to hold their own heading into December um, at, with like being around or in a playoff spot, you know, as momentum builds towards the end of the season and excitement builds, I, I think that, you know, with Calgary basically playing most of the games at home in uh, February, March, April, that that will help to boost the team even more so. Well, just to, to sort of point out what you're saying, Matt, I'm looking at the March schedule here. The Flames have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 home games in March and 1, 2, 3, 4 road games. So a lot of, lot of home ice, good for season ticket holders in March. And then April, same thing. They've got uh, 3, 4, 5, 6 home games, and they're about even in, in April, actually. Um, but yeah, March, February, there's not a lot of games in general, but March is going to be their big homestand month. Yeah. And on top of it, uh, they, this one, uh, site, they did a comparative of like quality of opponents and like just overall strength of schedule. And Calgary actually has the easiest schedule of any team in the entire NHL. What I like about their road schedules this year is they look more logical than we've seen in the past. And, and that's where, where yeah, like, there's a lot more efficiency in their travel instead of like yeah. going for like a two-game road trip to New York, coming back, and then going all the way back to the East Coast after like last year. 
or the last like, I'm regular looking year. To, I'm looking ahead to November here, and they play Montreal, Toronto back to back, then Ottawa, Philadelphia, Buffalo, New York, Boston. Like that's a pretty easy road trip. Yeah. Um, even this month, the one that we're going to talk about here, Detroit, Washington, and then New York, New Jersey. Like, again, a pretty easy road trip there. Oh, yeah. And, like, you're not wasting, you know, it's not like you're going from, say, Dallas to Tampa up to Boston and then back or something like that. Like, it, it's a lot more regionally focused which makes sense and time zones are going to play a large part of that too right you're not going like you said not only across the country and wasting energy and fuel but also you know having a three-hour time difference Uh. so let's look ahead to this the Calgary flames are going to play four games before we talk again uh tomorrow night on the 21st we're recording this on wednesday the 20th so tomorrow night in detroit 5 30 start time in the what is it now little caesars arena yeah then the Flames have their first matinee of the season, which is never good news for this team. An 11 a.m. game against Washington in Washington on Saturday. Then they get a day off on Sunday, and they'll play back-to-back uh, the New York Rangers on Monday the 25th at 5 p.m. Mountain Time and the 26th against New Jersey 5 p.m. Mountain Time. So four games there, Matt. What are you predicting for these four? Uh, two wins, two losses. Which two? Uh, wins against uh, the New Jersey Devils and the Detroit Red Wings and losses against the other two. See, they did exactly the opposite of what you predicted last week. You predicted two two wins and they got two losses. Well, so you see, that's the thing it... that, you know, like if you go through our predictions for all the years, if you just take the exact opposite of everything I say, I'd be mopping the floor with you handily. So... The exact opposite, though, is still going to be winning two games. So it really doesn't matter this week if they do the exact opposite. You're, you've you pretty much set yourself up well in both cases. I guess they'll get two wins, just the wrong two wins for you. Yeah. It's sort of like, did you ever play that game Mastermind as a kid where you can get right color, wrong position? Yeah. I think Calgary's going to beat Detroit. I think they're going to really struggle with Washington. And I think they're going to beat the Rangers, but not the Devils on the back-to-back. Because I think Dan Vlader is going to go in on the back-to-back against New Jersey, and I'm not sure he's going to look as good as he should in his first start. Yeah. Um, yeah. It'll be interesting to see. I, I think just having the ability to be on the road and out of the away from all the distractions, I think will help this team sort out their stuff on the ice more so and like get rid of those mental mistakes as they build a rhythm moving forward with some of these teams on this road trip being let's say weaker teams do you play vladar only in the new jersey game or do you put him in earlier Uh, i'd wait until the new jersey game and then you yeah that's probably the only time you see him then until the next back to back which is Montreal Toronto. Yeah, it, the thing is is that because the Flames have only played two games like it it doesn't make sense to sit him against Detroit and No, you've got to get Markstrom going. And then it doesn't really make sense to sit him against the Rangers cuz the Rangers are actually not too bad. So it's kind of hard to manage everything. Yeah, and you, you can't wreck his confidence either. Like, you put him against Washington, I think Washington's going to light him up, and that's not going to be good for his confidence. Like you said, the Rangers, I think, could light him up. If the Flames don't have a good defensive effort, the Rangers could light him up. So you've really got Detroit and New Jersey, but I think you're going to wreck Markstrom's confidence if you throw him in, if you take Markstrom out in Detroit. Yeah. Like, I think you got you got to get Markstrom going. So I agree with you, and I could even see... If we had a veteran backup, I could see the coaching staff running Markstrom in both the New York, the New York and New Jersey games just to get him going. But I think with a young backup, we really have no choice but to put him in in a lot of the back-to-back situations. Yeah, and for once, the Flames have a good young goalie that potentially, yeah, uh, that is showing at least in the preseason that you know there's a level of competence there. And hopefully that starts to translate, and maybe the Flames might have gotten a really good deal out of it. 
Yeah, we'll we'll see how it goes. I think they're gonna have to manage his numbers really well, just to you know make sure that he's not playing too much. And if he's not looking good, I think you'll see some times when maybe he has to be taken out mid game just to manage his confidence. But I also think the Flames are the best goaltending staff they've had in a while to help manage these goalies. Definitely. I mean, we have a whole goaltending department now, so I think we're gonna do a better job managing those goalies. Definitely. I was just at, I was just thinking to myself, where did Riddick end up? And he's in Nashville, and we play him on the second. So we'll talk about that next week. But I wonder if we see David Riddick in the dome against the Flames. Yeah. Well, one way or another, he'll get the the tip of the hat from the video crew. For sure, they always do a good job with that. All right, Matt. Well, let's enjoy this road trip. Let's hope the Flames can uh, translate some of their shots and the goals on this road trip, and finally. Uh, get a, a win. I think if we, you know, don't get a win on this road trip, we're, I don't want to say doomed, but we're not looking good. We got to get out of the basement of the Pacific division, finally beat Seattle and uh, get some points on the board. Yeah. And frankly, the flames just need to focus on getting those points on the board. And uh, ideally you'd like to see some of the top four guys getting a little bit more offensively involved than they have been. And I, I don't want to disparage any team in the league besides the Oilers, but I think if you want to get those guys involved, Detroit, New Jersey might be the game to get our top six going as well. Mm-hmm. You know, I think I don't want to say they're going to be easy games because there is no easy game in the National Hockey League, but I think they're games that you might be able to afford to to do a little bit more offensively and even get some of maybe your defense guys going as well to get that puck moving a little bit more in the offensive zone. So I'm thinking if they're going to come alive, I really think if they're going to come alive, it's going to be this road trip because we have opponents that will both be easier for them, like Detroit, and also I think opponents will challenge them. And we've seen the Flames look good when they're challenged as well. So I think that Washington game could really make the Flames be on their toes. You've said it a lot that the Flames tend to play to their opposition, and I think Washington could be that game where they have to up that game to play the opposition. Yeah, uh, especially going up against Ovechkin, which, you know, he's still kicking everybody's butt. Uh, Who do they have in goal this year there? um, Ilya Samsonov. Okay, so pretty good goalie, but yeah, I think the Flames might elevate their game in that one to play to their opponents. Uh Well, let's see how it goes, Matt, and I'll talk to you next week. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.